This is a special bonus edition of Judaism Unbound, Tanakh cast on the Secret Book of Kings. Welcome back, everyone. This is Dan Liebenson, and I'm introducing briefly a special bonus edition of Judaism Unbound, which is an episode of TanakhCast, a podcast hosted by Dan Mendelson Aviv, who was one of our earliest guests. He was our guest on episode nine. And Dan has been running this podcast, looking at various chapters of the Bible every week for a number of years now. And fortuitously, around the end of their exploration of the Book of Kings, the book, the secret book of Kings, that we were involved in came out and Dan interviewed me about the book. It's not 100% spoiler free, but it's not too spoilery. So I think anybody who hasn't yet read the book is still pretty safe to listen to this and will enjoy it. Hopefully you will read the book. You can also visit the website that we created for the book. It's at www.secretbookofkings.com. And we also encourage you to listen to the TanakhCast podcast in general. It's found on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever else, at TanakhCast, T-A-N-A-K-H. C-A-S-T, or you can also go to thenextjew.com, Dan's website, where he posts each week's episode of TanakhCast. So without further ado, we hope you enjoy this episode and tune in back again on Friday for a regular edition of Judaism Unbound. This is TanakhCast. Welcome back to TanakhCast. This is episode 89. I've entitled this episode The Secret Book of Kings Book Club Spoiler Special because, with the conclusion of Second Kings and the release of Yochi Brandes' Secret Book of Kings in English, I thought it would be a lovely idea to look at the Tanakh from a different perspective. Fiction. So I invited Dan Liebenson to join me again on TanakhCast. We had Dan on an earlier episode to discuss leadership models in Exodus. And aside from being an honorary Bible geek, he's also the founder, president, and fellow at the Institute for the Next Jewish Future. One of the projects of the Institute, besides their outstanding and provocative podcast, Judaism Unbound, which I'll link to at thenextjew.com, has been Yochi Brandes' book. He is the impresario of the English translation, and he cast his spell over an American publisher who agreed to produce an English edition of Mlachim Gimel, which was rendered into English as The Secret Book of Kings. Our talk focused primarily on the book, but we also talked about canon, extra canon, innovation, and living in transitional times. Thus endeth the summation, and beginneth the consideration. Thank you for once again joining us on Tanakhcast. It's always a pleasure to have you. So we just finished the second book of Kings. And so it was actually fortuitous and appropriate that we take a break from the Tanakh uh, flow to talk about this book, which in Hebrew was titled like Third Kings. Right. The third book of Kings, you know, really, really sort of positions itself from a title standpoint as, as another book in the Bible, although it doesn't obviously really purport to be that. So how did you come to be involved in, in this book? Well, it was in a time when I was working on this idea for an I, what I called an idea center that would be uh, a place that would be developing a new set of ideas about the Jewish future uh, and creativity that would bring about a Jewish future that was different from the Jewish present and past, but inspired by it. And uh, I was looking for sources of inspiration. And I had a conversation at one point with my sister who lives in Israel, where I was saying, you know, I really wish that there were more novels about the Northern Kingdom, because I think that the Northern Kingdom is this important part of our history and our legacy and our mythology that we only kind of know as they did evil in the sight of God, Mm -hmm. more or less. And, um, but you know, we know from archaeology and history that it was more, so much more than that. And, and I was saying, what if we actually kind of had a sense of the characters and who our ancestors were that would, that we could draw inspiration from, you know, for sort of a new remix of Judaism. And, and subsequently to that, I, and we can talk about it. I, I actually think that there's a lot more to it than that. But at the time, I really just was thinking about, about it that way. Uh, my sister said there was this book that was recently a big bestseller in Israel that that actually does that, uh, that, that is a um, perspective of the Northern Kingdom uh, on all this stuff. And um, and so I, I read it and and sure enough, it was that. And I got in touch with the author, which you can do in Israel. You know, you can just send emails to famous authors and and they respond. Um, and, uh, you know, I asked if, if this is uh, being translated and she said uh, that 
she struggled to find a publisher that wanted to bring it out in America. And I kind of said, could I give it a shot? And she said, you know, basically never heard of you, but whatever, you know, take your shot. Fortunately, through some some happy accidents, we were able to sell it to a major publisher. And and, and it really, from my perspective, uh, from the Institute for the Next Jewish Future, it's, it's just one of uh, many projects that we're working on, the, including um, the translation of, of Yochi Brandis' next novel, which has to do with the early rabbis. That's all about enlarging the uh, world of ideas that we have to draw on in terms of um, inspirations for ways of going about Jewish life that that are different from what we think it's limited to. Mm -hmm. As I read through the book, and, and we should feel free to spoil it. It's not like you know any of the events described in this book are. You know, it's not like in Sixth Sense where it's like you know the kid sees dead people and that. Knowing that would ruin everything. <laughs> you know, we know these characters, right? We know we know who these people are. We know their stories. We may not know them in quite the order that it was revealed in, in the book, but we know about the, the uprising against, you know, Solomon's son, and we know about the earlier stories. The question that I that kind of was, I was kind of playing with as I read through this book was, is this biblical fan fiction or is it mm -hmm. Midrash? I see it as something different and something in between because, for example, the example that you brought up of the rebellion against Solomon's son, it's quite clear from the Book of Kings that that rebellion was basically justified, right? That Solomon was really recruiting these this sort of forced labor to build his um, his building projects, including the temple, but not limited to the temple. And, and I believe that Solomon's own palace was much larger than the temple. And there were all, all these other big building projects. And that Solomon himself is not really portrayed ultimately as the greatest guy in the world. You know, he married all these foreign women and started worshiping foreign gods and all this stuff. And yet there's some notion that we seem to have have imbibed that Solomon was this like great wise king. And a lot of that comes from, you know, I would call that almost the fan fiction. You know, that's the, the later interpretation of the Book of Kings, either by the author of the Book of Kings himself, the Deuteronomist, who may have massaged the stories in, in different ways to kind of make Solomon seem like a better king than he was. But even the Deuteronomist uh, has left a lot of signs in there about Solomon being a very problematic king. And in a way, I feel like a novel like this, while it has, it's a novel, and so it has to be written in a way that draws the reader in, and it's exciting, and it's interesting. So there's an element where there's obviously going to be many additions and stuff that's not actually in the text. But I actually think in some ways this novel feels more true to me, to the original text, than than the text itself, or, uh, you know, various narrative elements of the text are, and yeah. certainly the later rabbinic interpretation. So I think it's really interesting to go into this question of, you know, well, who was Jeroboam? I mean, he led this rebellion against uh, Solomon's son, uh, you know, it's all, and we see this all the time, right, where the dictator um, is finally deposed or dies, I guess, and um, and his children can't hold on to the to the to the empire because they're maybe just not as ruthless as the original dictator was or you know would think about like the mafia this happening you know that you know right. we see this happening in the middle east today so i don't know it feels to me like it's really uh, there's a there's a sense of truth to this story that i sometimes feel is a more deeper truth than the text itself it's more fan fiction than midrash in the sense that the authors of midrash did not feel constrained by the conventions of the original story. Solomon can have encounters with demons in the Midrash, put them in chains and you know cast spells and do all kinds of things, whereas a biblical fan fiction writer would would still hew to the conventions of the original story. So that like Shlomo is not going to interact with anybody in the story that's not plausible for the terms of the original. For example, in the Secret Book of Kings, there is this kind of interlude where our hero interacts with Hadad and goes through this kind of rigorous training process. There are these fantastic elements, but still it's, it's plausible. He may have gone through some strange military training, you know, from this other guy, but he definitely wasn't, you know, consorting with demons the way that Solomon does with Ashmedai and some of the Midrashic literature. Right. But I mean, I think that that's why I, I'm not fully comfortable 
comfortable with the idea of fan fiction either, though, because I, I feel like fan fiction is a form of midrash that may be less that may they may be less uh, tied to the original elements of the story. But I, I think that what this is trying to do, and whether it's doing it effectively or whether it should be trying to do, I mean, all of these are other kinds of questions, but I think that what this is trying to do and imagines itself to be doing is actually uncovering stories that are actually in the text. Mm -hmm. um, and that if they're not in the text explicitly, they're implied by the text or possibly implied by the text. So again, to bring up an example that you brought up, which is um, the relationship with Hadad, if we look at the Book of Kings, it describes Hadad and Jeroboam in the same few verses as these two adversaries that God raised up against Solomon. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't specifically say that Hadad trained Jeroboam, but it also doesn't actually say how Hadad was an adversary, right? It, it's, it's unusual in the sense that it doesn't say that Hadad started some war against Solomon or against Rehoboam or whatever. It just kind of says that he was an adversary. And then in any event, the um, idea that, that it's not clear what Hadad does to be an adversary. And then very quickly thereafter is described Jeroboam as an adversary and we know what he did. Mm -hmm. The implication that Hadad trained Jeroboam, I think, is is a fascinating. Granted, it's a leap. It's a little bit of a midrashic or fan fiction leap. But I think it's a much smaller leap than a lot of other midrash or fan fiction that might use the characters but take them in a completely different storyline or an interesting direction, whereas I feel like The Secret Book of Kings is trying very hard to actually portray an alternative version of the story as it actually was and almost make the claim that not for sure this is how it actually was, but this might be, this is a plausible story that actually fits with the text as to how it really was. And for me, that's inspiring because I think about in particular with the Northern Kingdom, that after the destruction of the Northern Kingdom by the Assyrians in 722 BCE, in, in the literature of the, the Torah, of the Tanakh, and in the um, later kind of imaginings, it's imagined that all of the people from the Northern Kingdom were carried off in, into Assyria and beyond and became the Ten Lost Tribes. But the discoveries of recent archaeology are that the population of Jerusalem exploded in that period um, and the geographical area of Jerusalem, meaning that a tremendous number of refugees came from the north into the south, possibly, maybe probably, uh, the number of northerners living in the south was larger than the number of southerners, of Judeans. And if all of that is the case, then our ancestors are northerners as much as they are southerners. And I don't want to have a story about our ancestors that says that all they were were evildoers in the sight of God. You know, I love the idea that actually we could recover stories of the North that put the North in a positive light mm -hmm. because those are our ancestors. And if that's the case, then maybe we can draw a whole new set of inspirations from those ancestors about a way that we could be Jewish in the future that might be more true to the tradition of the North than the tradition of the South. And that that's not just cultural appropriation, you know, that that actually is the tradition of our ancestors. So maybe in the end of the day, that doesn't, you know, we're, that's not so inspiring for other people, but that's what's exciting for me. Well, there's another aspect of the, you know, talking in terms of telling the story, right? That, that there's a lot of talk in, in the Secret Book of Kings about who spins the narrative. In a sense, one of the things that struck me about the book is that it kind of cracks open the black box a little bit of the Tanakh. You know, that like how these texts were produced mm -hmm. um, and it sort of shows us in some sense, it's like when Toto, you know, comes and pulls the curtain aside in the Emerald City. And on the other hand, it also shows us that like this is a, a story that's that has many, many voices in it. Um, and some are the dominant voices and some are kind of buried in there and it just needs a little bit of uh, you know, clearing away of, of debris to get to. And for some people that like that, I guess, undermines the story for them that like, wait a minute, what am I not being told? But I think in a way also it does for me, it does the opposite. 
You know, I like the fact that like there's all this discussion about let's send out the storytellers and the poets to tell this story our way. You know, the, the possibility that like maybe the, the, the central the center section of this book where Michal is telling her story could have easily been a book of the Tanakh if circumstances had been different. Because it because the middle section, you know, in a lot of respects reminds me of the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. You know that it's written in first person. It's about that the, the story is driven by the protagonists kind of recounting their story, their struggles against larger forces. Right. And obviously the writing style of a modern novel has to be different from the writing style of an ancient Bible or, you know, an ancient, any ancient story text. It's, we have different conventions today, so it's going to be a, a little different in style, but, but absolutely. I think that that is kind of the, intent of the novel. And in my mind, it's a question of, we know that there were, that there are lost books, right? I mean, we know, um, even the Bible itself talks about different books, like the annals of the Kings of the, of Israel, of the North. And you have to imagine that those books were not written from the same point of view or with the same value system as the books that we have. And so, whether it's actually the book of Michal or, right, the odds are that Michal didn't write a book of her own right. because women in, at that time tended not to do that. But the idea that the, this book, right, the Annals of the Kings of Israel would have almost portrayed the flip side of the books that we have as the book of uh the book of the books of Samuel and the books of Kings it seems clear that that's the case you know and so from my perspective as a person who at least sees their lineage as coming from this line of people i have tremendous curiosity about what that book said mm -hmm. and in the bible we have a number of conflicting stories. The Bible, I think, is comfortable with conflicting stories sometimes. And the Talmud is quite comfortable with conflicting ideas and stories. And so I almost feel like one point of view could say, look, you know, the Judaism that we have today is the descendant of Judean Judaism, right? You know, and that's why it's called Judaism. Mm -hmm. um, and this northern business could all be kind of interesting and whatever, but it's not really part of Judaism because Judaism evolved after the destruction of the north. And so this is all kind of a pointless exercise. But I think that, first of all, that's not true because even in the text that we have, there is a strong northern voice incorporated into it. And so what that says to me is that even the Judaism that we have is a Judaism that is not fully a rejection of the North. And that once that sort of door is open, then I'm interested in what the North is really like even more. And if we can't actually recover those books, and who knows, maybe one day we will find some kind of find like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, probably not. It's probably too ancient and too, you know, not, not geographically in, in a dry place. So the, so the writings would have, would have been lost. But I can imagine what, what would happen if we did find a Dead Sea Scrolls of the North. And, and I would, be excited about that as as a modern Jew. It's to say, like, wow, we now have this whole new treasure trove of material to draw upon. And if we don't have that, if we won't ever find that book, then I feel like we can potentially find some of that book through the literary archaeology that we might do on the books that we do have alongside of the archaeology that we actually do have. And I think there have been a lot of books written lately uh, or at least a few about the archaeology of northern Israel and, and what's being found there and putting that together with some of the um, source critical findings about the stories of the north that have been retained in in the story cycle of the south, um, I think starts to paint a fascinating picture of the north that this book, I feel like, is actually quite true to. And so, again, it's fiction and it's creating a book of Michal that probably never existed. And at the same time, what I'm trying to get at is that I think it's very plausible in terms of its point of view about 
the characters that it's talking about, whether those are Michal or Saul or Jeroboam, mm -hmm. that help us start to understand what would a book that saw those characters in a positive light look like. And is that of any relevance to us today? You know, as much as you've got this um, podcast, Tanakh cast, that looks at the Tanakh that we have, it's really interesting to think about why you're doing that. You know, what's the value of exploring the Tanakh that we have? And then my, you know, mirror image question is what would be the value of exploring the Tanakh that we don't have? Do you think we're too late to tweak the Jewish canon? It's a great question. I think that the goal is not to tweak the Jewish canon. I think, yes, the, the, well, the Jewish canon, I, I, right. I, I don't think it's too late to add to the Jewish canon. So the question becomes, right, because, because when the temple, the second temple was destroyed and rabbinic Judaism came onto the scene, initially it was not a text-based tradition, right? It was an oral tradition. And, you know, a hundred some odd years into it, it kind of developed its first text, the Mishnah. And at some point, the Mishnah was imagined to be as canonical a text as the Tanakh, and then later the Talmud. So... If, and, and, and in some ways, even more so. And a mythic understanding was developed that in some way, that's always kind of mysterious when you think about it, that the, that the oral law was also given at Sinai. Mm -hmm. And so we can imagine back, and maybe that's what I'm doing to some extent in, in trying to emphasize the value of the stories of the North, that, that there's some mythic role that it helps to achieve by imagining back some time in which this stuff was really real. But the question that you asked, you know, can the canon be expanded even late in the game? It seems to me that it has to be, right? That if we're going to see a major transition in what it looks like to be Jewish, which is really the project that I'm working on more generally, it seems like that's going to have to include some new canon of texts, whether those texts are, are written texts of the same nature, like books and whatever, or maybe those written texts are podcasts or videos or uh, websites, you know, it, that's hard to say, but it, but it feels like that there is going to be some new, this, some new source of canonical ideas that will eventually, I think, be folded into the larger canon and seen as, as let's say, a third, a third version. Well, I think the one area where I think the, the canon can be tweaked is by bringing in the voices of women, which is definitely, I think, what you know, one of the other agenda items of uh, Yochi Brandes was in, in this book, if I may suggest that. I mean, there's a lot of room to for women's voices to be brought in. And often when I think of additions to the Jewish canon, the first thing that pops to mind is like Fiddler on the Roof, which is definitely like another form of myth making. I don't know. Right. I mean, I could be overstepping my bounds here as a historian, but I don't think that Shtetl life was like that per se. Right. But for many people, that's like a touchstone like that and Yentl and um, I would say The Chosen by Chaim Potok, all of which have really lovely, you know, cinematic portrayals. So maybe movies might be, but I mean, mm -hmm. but even then, like, mm -hmm. you know, you were talking earlier about the different conventions that like, you know, books written today are, are going to be written in a style that's kind of incompatible with the biblical style. But even in storytelling in movies, like you watch movies from the seventies or the eighties and they're much slower paced than, and cut and edited the went than movies today. So, but the, I think, I guess my question is if we're going to tweak the canon and add to it, can we add items to it in a way that it will, will carry forward. You know, archivists are always challenged with like, okay, I'm going to put all of the data we have on these five and a quarter inch floppy disks. And then someone right. comes along and says, uh, we don't store it on that kind of stuff anymore. Put it on laser disk. And then right. before you even finish doing that, then it's like, oh, here, here's a zip disk. Here's a USB key. And then now we're just putting everything in the cloud. How, like what for, like, and this is something you're sort of preoccupied with, with, your institute is, is, is looking to the next thing. So I'm going to put you on the spot and say, like, is this kind of thing the next thing? No, I don't think it is. I, I think that we're in a transitional period. I, you know, mythologically, I've, I've thought of ourselves much more as 
being a desert generation wandering in the wilderness, um, that that metaphor speaks to me in terms of where we are in, in this uh, iteration of Jewish history. And I think that, um, this question of, of the enduring texts or the enduring next group of, of texts or whatever they might be into the canon is premature in this time. I mean, part of me wishes that, you know, we were actually the generation that was writing the next canon, they're the next canonical materials, but, but somehow I, my sense is that we are not. Um, and, and I think that some of the things that you're talking about, you know, for example, the, the changes in technology that make whatever form of technology we're using at a certain point in time obsolete soon. I think that was equally true during the time that we're, we're talking about. Um, and that's why I think a lot of the uh, source materials were lost. I mean, it's possible that some of the source material was lost because people intentionally destroyed them. Mm-hmm. But I think that it probably was because they were writing them on material that didn't last. And um, there was a culture of scribes that would, you know, keep some of it being written again and again. And so some of that stuff would last longer because it was, you know, but it would also be degraded in the copying most likely. And probably only in the time of, of the Babylonian exile, maybe, or shortly after, my guess is that there was some, you know, sort of revolution in terms of the technology of scrolls that really made it possible for the text to be canonified. Uh, is that a word? Um, canonized, and I think. Uh, canonized, yeah. right. Right, and um, although that'd be a good name for an app, canonified, <laughs> canonified, yeah, and that that you know the fact that that um, Ezra or whoever might have been the redactor uh, happened to live in a time where of of the stabilization of technology of writing may as much explain the reason why we have the Torah as we have it than anything that was about the task of its time that it, or that it happened to be such a brilliant uh, synthesis. Maybe it was just the first synthesis that was accomplished during a time in which the um, preservation materials were, were more effective, you know, and, and, and that's kind of how I would think going forward. So to me, like these kind of short, uh, these kind of movies that you're talking about that are slow paced, like those are transitional times, you know, and, and um, those won't be the movies that we uh, will have as part of the canon going forward. And, and probably nothing that we do in our time, sadly, as it might be, especially for those of us who produce content, will probably be the stuff that actually uh, lasts, but I find it inspiring to think that that's not our task, right? That our task is one of of transition, and um, that we can imagine that there'll be a time in the future when 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 the new thing will be ready and it will be ready to be canonized or ready to be kind of firmed up. But but right now, I think it's really more about uh, a process, and uh, and 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 so to me, like again, back to the metaphor of wandering in the wilderness. Like I think that the great leadership uh, move of Moses or of God in the story is to say, we have to leave here, um, and we, even though we don't know what the other thing is going to look like. We have to get start moving because if we stay here, it's not gonna it's not gonna be good. Um, mm. And then the second leadership move is to say, and now that we've left there, let's not let's not jump the gun in terms of trying to find a next stage. And maybe that is a more interesting interpretation of the story of the scouts than the fact that, you know, that they did a bad job. You know, maybe what we learn from the story of the scouts being sent in and finding that there are giants there and everything and we can't do it is that that's just the natural thing that's going to happen if you jump to the let's view the future too quickly, Mm -hmm. that it's always too overwhelming. It always feels like we can't do it. It always puts a kind of pressure on us that we can't live up to. So actually the, the lesson there and the positive leadership move that maybe Moses and maybe God make at that point is to recognize that it was an error to try to get there too quickly. And, and the wandering in the desert for 40 years, rather than seeing that as a punishment, we could see it as a realistic understanding that this is the way that transitions have to happen and that we have to have this kind of messy period of exploration where the one thing we know is that we have left the old thing behind and that we aren't at the new thing yet. Now what do we do? And that's kind of how I'm looking at this.
doesn't every generation look at itself as a transitional generation? I mean, I'm sure you're of them in the book when he, you know, deposes or th- overthrows the yoke of, of Solomon's sons. I'm sure he would say to himself, you know, we're in a transition right now. We're not, we don't have a new kingdom yet, but we don't have the old one either. Yeah. And I was, look, I mean, I think some people don't actually have the humility to say that. And they believe that, that they um, are going to jump right from the old way to the new way. And uh, maybe sometimes that happens um, successfully. But I think that Yeravam is is that figure, you know, um, is that transitional figure. And again, we don't know the real history. Was there really one, uh, Jeroboam or not? But, you know, again, archaeologically, at least the kingdom of Israel is um, identified with the line of Omri. So what about all those kings that preceded Omri, including uh, Jeroboam and and uh, Basha? And, and you know better than I all the names of the, the other ones. And so I, I guess like, like uh, the way that I read that is that there was this transitional period there, too. And, and and I think also, for, in my mind, the Babylonian exile is this time of transition. And, you know, there are these times of transition. So, you know, the fact that that's a recurring theme to me actually strengthens the idea that that we're living in one of them. The question, does everybody always think that they're living in a transitional period? Like, I don't think so. I mean, I feel like, you know, my, my sense of, of that there have been long periods of Jewish history uh, in which people have imagined that this is what Judaism is and and more or less will always be. It doesn't mean there are like not small evolutions here and there, but but I, I think that and I, and I actually think that that's the aspiration, right? Like I think people want to be in a kind of smooth, stable state, and so I think people actually prefer to imagine themselves as not in a time of transition, but actually in a time of stability. And my bigger concern is not that people always imagine themselves to be in a time of transition, but that people are always trying to kind of stop the transition, um, you know, because they'd rather, they, not for any nefarious purpose, but just because they want to, they want to be stable. They don't want to, they don't like transition. They don't like uncertainty. And then that's why I think that it's actually an act of leadership to insist that we're in a time of transition and that we're going to be in a time of transition for our whole lives. So don't imagine that like we're going to find this uh, solution in the next 10 years. And by the way, like taking this from the realm of the Tanakh to the realm of Jewish innovation today in our world, I, I really have a lot of concern that there, that there's a lot of um, anxiety and a lot of pressure, for example, from funders and other forces in the Jewish community to say, um, okay, like to these new organizations that are innovating, like what's your plan for 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 sustainability and stability and this um, under, notion that somehow in the last ten years we've had a lot of innovation and hopefully those innovation organizations have discovered something and now it's all about stabilizing them and they're going to be the nucleus of a new. Judaism and everything's going to be okay again, you know, but I don't think that's it. I, I think that we're, we, the, for my mind, the question is like, what would it look like if we could imagine that the next hundred years of Jewish history in America are going to be time of, of tremendous instability and change in every generation and that that's what we should be expecting and, and actually wanting because only that way are we going to find something really awesome on the other end and, and what would it look like if we really embraced that? But how do you establish a tradition if every 20 years, everything flips or every 20 years, everyone feels that they're still wandering and we haven't arrived at the promised land yet. Yeah, that's the that's the real question. I mean, I think that's that was the question in the story of the Exodus. And and that's why it's such an amazing metaphor. You know, I, I think that that means that the task for leaders is is complex. You know, lately, I've been thinking about a sort of two pronged approach. Um, in fact, in my mind, I've, I've been thinking about Hillel, the elder, who, you know, arguably is the founder of rabbinic Judaism. Um, and he, he his life took place during the time of Herod, which was the time in which the temple uh, this was at its most glorious period, and uh, again, arguably, but I mean, at least physically it was. Mm-hmm. You know, Hillel, in, in my imagining of him, knew that this was not going to last. Uh, but he also knew that if he tried to just do something new, it would be premature and, you know, he, he wouldn't know what the new thing was yet. And so somehow he needed to start the process of discovering some totally new way of being Jewish. And at the same time, keep the people feeling secure and stable during that transition period, which mm-hmm. he knew was going to be, you know, a hundred or 200 years, you know, in this imagining it's, it's it, it, Hillel being that kind of leader, Moses being kind of, that kind of leader, 
uh, and maybe Jeroboam being that kind of leader, that the idea is that you need to um, not be rejectionist about the old stuff, you know, that to, to actually find the continuing relevance of the old stuff and the continuing um, inspiration of the old stuff, all the while trying to keep it more um, exciting, more alive, because you, you see that it's not working quite the way that it used to. But that's less radical than inventing something entirely new, which you can't do right away. So, so I think it's something in the, along those lines that you have to kind of hold on to the tradition that you do have and work on it, you know, try to make it more progressive, a little more fun, exciting. Uh, and I think a lot of the innovation that we're seeing in the Jewish world today is essentially trying to do that. While at the same time you're you know you've got a diversified for- portfolio where you're also investing in in all kinds of more radical reimaginings um that that could one day uh turn into something really new which is why i think that you know as as you framed you know your institute's sort of relationship with this book that this book in a sense is a very traditional modality right we are the people of the book this is a book we like books and it's a book about the book of books so it's like doubly interesting and especially because of its very engaging storytelling and the way it sort of drives the plot and, you know, there are mysteries to uncover in the, in the context of the story. There is, there is a kind of innovation here, but not an innovation in like the incubator, or, you know, high tech innovation kind of sense, but innovation in terms of how we think about Tanakh, how we think about tradition. And, you know, I, I was very excited to read it. It was uh, really well written. I strongly identify with these characters because I'm kind of a, a Bible nerd in that sense. Do you think that books like this, like Yochi's next book, will capture the imagination the way that this one does? I do. I agree with you that I mean, I agree with I agree with you on on two levels. I think one that that I do think that these books are, even though they I think raise ideas and possibilities that can be taken in that more radical invention inventive direction that I'm talking about. They also work profoundly well for that kind of um, stabilizing role of, of saying, you know, how can our current tradition be more meaningful to us today? You know, well, this slightly different perspective gives us this, this sense that this is actually more relevant to us uh, in our modern lives today. Mm-hmm. And second, that on the one hand, the people that are real nerds about this stuff will have the most profound experience reading these books because they are because they are weaving together stories that that you know and that you didn't know could be woven together. So, you know, for example, in this book, there's there's this um, episode about the about who killed Goliath, and you know, those of us who are Tanakh nerds would know that in the book of Samuel there are two stories about who killed Goliath. Um, and those of ones who are even bigger nerds would know that the second story, which says that a guy named Elchanan killed Goliath, actually is retold again in, in the book of Chronicles, where it says that Elchanan killed the brother of Goliath because the writer of Chronicles was so uncomfortable with the idea that there's another story of who killed Goliath in the book of Samuel that that he thought that must be a scribal error and fixed it in the book of Chronicles. Or maybe there's some other natural history of how that came to be. And that, mm-hmm. and that those of us who are even bigger nerds, you know, will know that the King James translation picked up on Chronicles version and actually translates the book of Samuel to say that Elchanan killed the brother of Goliath. So the English reader of the Bible wouldn't even know that there's an issue here. So when we read this novel and we see that there's a whole chapter given to this story about who Elchanan and David were and that they were actually allies in killing Goliath and it turned out in the story that Elchanan killed Goliath but David took the credit for it and the implica- you know and that's why we have this these two different stories because in in the novel it's that Michal inserted this other little story about Elchanan killing Goliath to sort of let the reader know that there might be an issue here she actually in the novel isn't sure what happened either that is a great story if you already know the stories i, I feel like if you don't already know the stories but you only know that David killed Goliath i feel like you would read this story and say, like, what the hell is this with the Elchanan killing Goliath? Like, and hopefully you would take a little bit of um, initiative. And we have a website, you know, where we where we um, have notes on the 
novel at secretbookofkings.com where you can go and look at that chapter and then it would tell you there this whole business that I just mentioned about the different texts. So, you know, for, for the sort of curious reader who knows the Bible a little, I think with the help of our website or of Google or whatever, like they can actually discover a lot of really interesting things. And then I think there's the other reader who just read this as, as a really um, a fun novel and would know that it in some way is connected to uh, biblical material. And, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm really fascinated in that reader saying like, um, gee, you know, um, uh, I've always learned this thing about David killing Goliath. It turns out that, uh, you know, this guy Elchanan killed Goliath possibly. So, uh, you know, what am I going to make of that? You know, even without doing all the research. So I, mm-hmm. so I think that, um, you know, in some ways, I, I think that's the most exciting kind of reader because it's a reader that says, you know, look, I mean, it's all interesting what scholars have found and everything. But um, as a reader of literature, you know, part of my job is to make meaning out of it uh, for me and in this time. So, you know, that I'm curious where that would go as well. And um, Yochi's next book, which is about the early rabbis, I think is, is probably... Um, you know, all the more so like that, because um, I think they'll be in terms of readers, they'll skew, you know, more people know about the Bible than about the early rabbis. So I think there'll be more readers who will be in that position of either saying, wow, this piques my curiosity and I want to go and and read uh, the the rabbinic material now so that I can understand this better. And there'll be a lot of readers who are going to say, you know, I don't know any of these stories, but wow, this is a, this is a rollicking good novel. And uh, I'm really kind of fascinated to know about all these characters now, and maybe the novel will be their sole introduction to these stories. And, mm-hmm. and, and that, you know, again, like I think why it's not irresponsible from Yochi's perspective is because I really believe that, that the stories she is telling are plausible versions of the stories that are told in the Bible and in the, in the early rabbis. And, and in mm-hmm. fact, those of us who read the early rabbis' uh, stories in the Talmud often have seen these little stories as these disconnected snippets that, um, you know, are these kind of nice, like, uh, aphorisms, basically. But in the novel, Yochi stitches them all together. So the, so, so every character's, all the stories that the Talmud tells about a particular character get lined up and told in a particular order that makes that character actually make sense as a character, and it makes mm-hmm. sense that these different stories happen because they, they fit with the historical experience of that character. And then all the stories stitched together of all the characters tell a, a meta story. And I think that a person who is introduced to the Talmud first by reading this book and then later studies Talmud will have such a different experience of those famous Talmudic stories than somebody who, who was introduced to them from the Talmud that it really could would produce, you know, just would naturally produce an entirely different vision of, of the whole thing. And, and so will that ever happen? I don't know, but it would be so exciting to imagine that it could happen. So when are you going to finish, uh, translating, uh, book two of the- Well, it's finished. Um, well, it's finished. The, the question is when, you know, when it'll be published and that, that I don't know that, um, that that's just really a question of publishers' schedules and whatnot. I, I hope uh, I hope within a year. Well, it's an amazing. I mean, I read the book in Hebrew, and it's amazing. It blew my mind. So I'm really excited that the translation for it is finished. Where can people get the Secret Book of Kings if they uh, are so disposed to do? Well, they can definitely get it on uh, Amazon or in any online place where books are sold. There is a. Um, uh, hardcover currently available and a uh, ebook. We are hoping that there'll soon be an audio book. We're working on that and narrated by Patrick Stewart. I hear <laughs> that would be wonderful. We'll see. He's a little bit beyond our uh, price range, but there is um, and and uh, you know and at some point there'll be a soft cover. So, but we uh, it's really available everywhere online. I think it's. Um, possibly harder to find in uh, any given bookstore as pretty much any book is hard to find in a bookstore these days, but you can also go to your local bookstore and have them ordered for you. That's uh, definitely something anyone can do. Well, thank you for your time and for your hard work on bringing Yochi Brandes to a North American audience. 
So thanks for having me on. Thanks a lot. If you like what you heard today, spread the word about Tanakh Cast. Send a friend an email to say, hey, you should check out Tanakh Cast. Or like Tanakh Cast at the show pages on Facebook or Google. Or write a brief review at the iTunes Store, Google Play, Stitcher Smart Radio, or SoundCloud. It's a small thing, really, but it will help other people find Tanakh Cast. Or if you want to help in a bigger way, support us at Patreon. Just search for TanakhCast and pledge your shekels, either on a one-time or monthly basis, and receive special blessings from the Most High. I thank you in advance for that. And I encourage you to join us again in two weeks for... Episode 90, when we begin the Latter Prophets, the Book of Isaiah, chapters 1 through 3. Thank you.